I'm going to go ahead and start this because we need to do it. And uh, I've got a, I'm making a video capture of it anyway, so we can, so somebody else can see it if they need to. But uh, what are your three harmful gases? And two harmless beneficial gases. What's the harmful three? HCCO and HCCO and NOx. Okay. HCCO and NOx. Got that? Okay, so why is it that you call NOx NOx? And how did, and where does it come from? Huh? Yeah. Uh, oxides of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it can be any number down here. Like, you know, like if this is going to be this many molecules. Right, it wouldn't matter. It would still be poisonous. Right. Whatever, yeah. I mean, if it's, it, it, it can be, you know, two, three, four, or five. It can be a bunch of them. So what we've got out here is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Right. And whenever you run the hydrocarbons, which is a real complex, heavy molecule, which is your uh, gasoline, it's you know hydrogen and carbon put together, uh, run it through there, and you, whenever you burn the fuel, the park lights off, it puts those molecules together. Oxygen unites with the hydro, hydro, hydrocarbon. So you've got a carbon molecule. That has come when you know become a part. You know, is sharing electrons basically. When it happens, it creates heat and energy, and that's why that's what your burner is in here. Okay, so since you got HC and oxygen coming together, all right, you got your O, you got your N, well you can call it O2, and you got your HC going into your combustion chamber. All right, coming out through your tailpipe, you got, you know, if the mix is right, and pay attention to this, and look over here, Chris. No way, you know, I'm sorry. But uh, there was a guy named Chris Pilons that used to work here, and I got you know, his name crossed up because his last name is Pilons. But anyway, um, what comes out is going to be a, all these things coming together. That's what's going in. So what's coming out is a little more complicated. All right, so what you got coming out of there, if the mixture is a little too rich, if it's 14.7 to 1, to 1, you're going to get CO2, which is just fine. That ain't really hurting anything. And uh, there's actually a website you can go to called CO2isGreen.com. Talks a lot about it. But anyway, um, now that's coming in, that's going in. And this is coming out. If you've got too much of this and not enough of that for whatever reason, you're going to come out with CO, which means every one of these carbon molecules likes to get married to two oxygen molecules if it can. And there's your CO2. That would uh, be rich, right? Uh, yeah, if it's rich, you're going to get CO. If it's real rich, you're going to get HC, which means that. There was some of the hydrocarbon molecules. Did you find it right there? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's some of the hydrocarbon molecules that didn't get any oxygen. So some of them only get one molecule of oxygen. Some don't get none. The ones that don't get any are HC. The ones that get one are CO. The ones that get everything they want is CO2. But in addition to all this, when this is going on, and you're also making, because there's hydrogen in there, you're also making water. Remember what I told you last semester? You make a gallon of water for every gallon of gas you burn. In the wintertime, it makes uh, steam come out the exhaust pipe. You can't see it whenever it's, the engine's good and hot. Enough. It also so stuff. pretty much, you got a, a grayish exhaust pipe. you got a pretty good mixture there? Pretty much. I mean, and it, it sort of varies a little bit. It used to be great a light tan, you know. And now some of them, you don't see anything in there. As a matter of fact, you can actually go to one of the, uh, you know, one of the, uh, on the rail, 6.4 liter, these new power stroke diesels, you can take a white glove on the inside of the pipe and get anything on your hand. That's how clean that thing is. All right, so now they're putting urea in there and making it even cleaner than one. But anyway, whatever you got, what you got here, and this, this right here, 
would be O, O, and C. You know, when the hydrogen gets together because of the thing, you get water. That's, a, you get, that's one of your, incidentally, on your next question, one of the harmless gases is water vapor, which, incidentally, the EPA has started trying to act like water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Think about that now. What you can do about the clouds? I mean, that's what they're doing. They're, they're talking that smack about water vapor being greenhouse gas. Okay, and then you got your carbon dioxide, which I've heard in all the things. This is a harmless gas. Water vapor is a harmless gas. And but you got your NOx. Now NOx happens. Who can tell me about NOx? Where does NOx come from, and why is it? How does it come together? If you got 78% nitrogen in the atmosphere, some of that's going to be in there, not really doing anything. It's an inert gas, but it does tend to bond itself to mo oxygen molecules while all that's going on. And because if the heat goes above, there's a threshold, 2,500 degrees. When it's burning and under pressure, it can go hotter than that. If it goes above that threshold, you're going to have NOx, and we don't want that. So, what do we do to take care of NOx? Well, let's go ahead and answer our questions here. Uh, number one, we got the harmful three, or hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, which doesn't smell, you don't smell it, you can't see it, but it will kill you. And then we've got hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are not measured the way the other gases are. They're measured in parts per million, right? Okay, now your other two uh, beneficial gases, like I said, are water vapor and carbon dioxide. What does the exhaust gas recirculation system control? That's when, it, that's when some of the exhaust gas uh, is actually routed into the intake right there behind the throttle plate, and it goes into the mix, and it actually makes the combustion chamber not so hot. So what's it going to control by keeping the combustion chamber a little cooler than 2,500? Remember? And uh, keep the gas cooling too long. Huh? And keep the, the gas cooling too long. Well, it's just basically you're wanting to replace some of that burnable mix in there with something that won't burn. That's all you're really doing with EGR. And because of the fact that EGR is like it is, you can advance the timing a little more. And when you advance the timing a little bit more, it gives you a little bit, you know, there's some benefits from that. But you're controlling NOx. <laughs> With your EGR, so the, there, huh? The EGR is recirculating the old gas into the exhaust. Tube. Well, it's recirculating the already burned. You know, it's basically putting carbon dioxide back in there, or you know, and whatever else is in there. Whatever else, if it's got carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, whatever happens to be in that exhaust stream where it's pulling in, that's what it's going to be doing. All right, so there you go. You got your uh, exhaust gas recirculation is there to control NOx. So what is the optimum air fuel mixture for the cleanest burn? 14 to 7 to 1. 14 .7 to 1. All right. So, and that, what are they, uh, let's see, let me go on there. What, uh, why was it necessary to remove lead from gasoline in the 1970s? They used to have lead. You ever notice that have labels on these old antique gas pumps? Is this motor oil or gasoline contains lead? Because lead is poisonous. What? No, well, it is, but that ain't why they pulled it out of there, you know. But uh, the reason that they have, why did they put lead in there to begin with? If we don't have lead in there now, why do we ever have lead in there? You got any idea about that? Nope, doesn't do anything except what it would do. The lead had a propensity to coat the valves and keep them sealing good. You know, the fuel manufacturers put lead in there because it was good for the engine. You know, the engine kind of liked having the, the place, you know, where the, where the valves are opening and hammering against their seat all the time. They would slowly get coated with tiny amounts of lead, and that would help them to seal better. That's why they did that. The only reason they did it. The engine actually put a little didn't, it would Yeah, what happens, it would beat the uh, valve seats up into the head and destroy them and everything. And they also, when they took the lead out, they had to lower the compression a little bit. So anyway, that uh, the whole shooting match about that lead was it just it was good for the engine. Well, then they came up with these idea that they, they said, well, what are we going to do to treat this gas so we can get rid of the hydrocarbons and the oxygen? I mean, in the uh, in the carbon monoxide, uh, that was the two they were worried about to start with. They weren't even worried about NOx to begin with, other than not as far as treating it with a catalytic converter. They did put EGR on there back in the early 70s to try to cool the combustion chamber, and they hoped that would do it. 
whenever stuff. And I've got a little, a couple of little PowerPoint slides I want to show you on what emission systems, you know, what emission controls did. I mean, how they, you know, changed over the years. And I'm going to show you that in a little bit. But uh, the fact was the catalytic converter. Last, the catalytic converter has got this strata in it. It's ceramic. It's a honeycomb. And whenever the, the stuff goes through there, it's got this vermiculite blanket around the outside of it. And, it's, and this has got platinum, for palladium, and rhodium, and, season, and other stuff in there. And, and I think cerium, some of them have got in there. But the point is, a catalyst is something that can change the chemical make up of other things without changing itself. Well, you put lead through here and it begins to coat this and after a while this is all stopped up with lead. Now that's why they took the lead out because they put these in there. And I'll tell you something else that was funny. When they first started making these and when they first came up with the design and how this was going to have to be built, they said there's no way on earth that these can be manufactured on a large scale. For all the parts. There's no way you can do it. Well, they found out that there was a kind of clay in Georgia. And I think that's about the only place in the whole world you can get it is over in Georgia. <laughs> I think, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, you had to use that clay, and they came up with a process to make these catalytic converters, and now you can buy them at the parts house, you know, for not a whole lot of money. But anyway, that's a catalytic converter that's cut. All right, there, so you can see what's going there. Okay, now. They took the lead out because they didn't want to mess up the catalytic converter. That's question number four. All right. Uh, what vehicle emission does the evaporative system control? The evaporative system. Which the evaporative system, you see the little carbon canister. You're going to see that as we walk around under cars and all that kind of stuff. I've usually got a carbon canister sitting in here when I start teaching this and I drop the ball this time. But it's got carbon fibers in it, and it traps the fuel vapors from the evaporating gasoline in the tank. In other words, as the gas in the tank evaporates, it's got a little line that goes all the way to this carbon canister. And then periodically, there's some valves and stuff that open up and let vacuum from the engine pull that, you know, purge that uh, canister and pull those vapors out of there. Uh, we don't want them vapors getting out into the atmosphere. Uh, in, in California, and Amanda, you may have seen that in some of the places that you've lived, where when you put the gas in the car, they got this big accordion-looking thing on the, around the gas nozzle. That's to capture hydrocarbons. Uh, what we have on most of our cars now, including even that old sable out there, is what they call onboard vapor recovery, and it's got up in the uh, in the little uh, chamber there where you put your gas in a little thing that's made to capture that vapor even while you're gassing up. And it's on a OR, it's got a strange uh, uh, ORVR or something like that, onboard vapor recovery system. Is what that, and it goes to the canister down there. And you can see that system if you uh, investigate it a little bit. But the evaporative system is what we have to use our smoke machine to check whenever we're getting a code. Amanda had seen on that uh, a Volvo that she was looking at yesterday that they had a small evaporative leak. If it's got an evaporative leak that's bigger than 20 thousandths of an inch on the newer cars, uh, the evaporative system is designed to put pressure on the tank. It wants the tank basically to hold pressure whenever things lock down. And um, so when it closes all of the vents off where nothing can go anywhere, um, and then it'll actually pressure the tank up if it's got between 15% uh, and 85% fuel in the tank, it'll pressure the tank up and look for that pressure to bleed off. You see, and it may be water uh, pressure. You know, and I'm, when I mean water pressure, it's like water vacuum. Uh, and you know, merc mercury vacuum is real strong. Water vacuum is real weak, but it's strong enough to where they can tell if it's got a leak. There's another way they do it too, to see if it's got a leak. Or Chrysler's and stuff, and some of the other manufacturers. I think Chrysler came up with it first, at least as far as domestic automakers. Uh, what happens when you park your car and everything uh, cools off, the temperature changes and all that? Doesn't pressure come and go out of the tank, even in the summer, when everything changes? The temperatures change, and the 
the air ought to be able to come and go. Well, Chrysler got really slick. They said, why don't we need to put all this heavy-duty evaporative system checking on there? We can use, we can put a little thing on here so that when you park the car, the engine controller knows how long the car has been parked. And as the pressure is supposed to change, we know that as the temperature changes, the pressure should change this much in the tank with this fuel level. And so if it fails to close this little switch, you know, they call that NVL, natural vacuum leak detection, then we know that we've got a leak in our evaporative system, natural vacuum leak detection. And uh, that's why a lot of the times when you switch it off, you didn't have a check engine light. And then when you crank it up to drive off, now you got a check engine light that you didn't have last time. And, of course, there's a bunch of reasons that can happen. But a lot of times, if it's got an evaporative system code, it'll do that. Um, but what Amanda picked up on yesterday was that that lady didn't quite have her gas cap on tight enough. And we looked at that, and she was able to, you know, the lady just tightened it up. I don't even know if she clicked it. It felt real loose. And when I was talking to her about it, she says, well, it was pretty cold. I probably didn't spend a lot of time <laughs> clicking the thing. She just spun it on there and got back in the car. And then she, that was one of her reasons for a check engine light. Um, incidentally, you know, she probably was telling you about that. She was getting shabby treatment from the Volvo dealer in Dauphin and the one in Montgomery. You know, she just plumbing disgusted with that. One of them cranked the car and saw that the light was on and said, well, it runs okay. Why do we need to work on it? <laughs> and, uh, anyway. Black smoke from the exhaust is a strong indicator of what? If you see black smoke coming out of the exhaust, what do you know? Huh? No, that's not black smoke. All smoke is blue. Steam is going to be white. Black smoke is hydrocarbon. That's soot. That's your running really rich. Now, if it's running rich enough, it can get it can blow uh, gasoline steam out the back and get your hand wet with gas. Ain't that before. All right. And this is something I answered earlier. Uh, what actually happens at the molecular level when fuel burns in the combustion chamber? Remember what we were talking about? What happens when anything burns? Okay, let me hit you with this. What happens when a piece of metal rusts? What do they call that? Oxidation. So what does it look like if you go to somebody and says, this car burned all the way down to the rims after the carburetor caught fire? What, is the, what does the metal look like? It's rusty. So anyway, anything burns typically is oxidizing. That's what it's doing. Oxygen unites with it. That's what happens there. Um, it also happens with vitamins in your body. You know, vitamin E sacrifices itself to pay vitamin C, which sacrifices itself to pay vitamin A. These are your antioxidant compounds and all that. Because when it oxidizes them, it neutralizes the effectiveness of it. Um, uh, how many of you know what the second law of thermodynamics is? You know what the first law of thermodynamics is? You can't create matter or energy. You can only trade one for the other, right? That's the first law. The second law basically says that if you heat something up, it's going to cool off. You're moving heat from one place to the other. It also means that if you put something out there, uh, if I park a Crown Victoria or a GMC Sierra or any other kind of vehicle out there in the woods and I leave it out there for 10 years and I come back, the tires are going to be flat, the battery's going to be dead, and you ain't going to be able to drive it. That's the second law of thermodynamics. It's coming all apart. You can take it and put it together, but it's not going to stay together without you propping it up. See what I'm saying? Basically, it just takes all that. The third law of thermodynamics basically is out of the game. There's no way you can do anything except swap matter for energy, and then that's going to, you know, you're you're going to create heat and energy in motion. Like if I start a bicycle wheel spinning, unless something keeps it spinning, it's going to stop. You got to keep putting energy in there to keep it spinning. You know, as long as you got energy. I could put Lonzo over here turning a crank, whooping around on that thing, but after a while, he's going to get tired and he's going to go get something to eat. Because he needs to make convert matter to energy so he can go back to work. You know what I mean? That's what keeps everything going. And uh, if you don't eat, then you'll get sick and die. <laughs> and the wheel's going to stop then. You see what I'm saying? Uh, but anyway, uh, now what does the term stoichiometric mean? Remember that? That's the clean burn. Let me give you a little caveat, caveat on that. Uh, there are sometimes, you know, 14.7 to 1 is supposed to be the cleanest burn for everything. But 
there are some times whenever your your engine controller is going to change that mix up or down a little bit to suit prevailing conditions so that it can get the cleanest burn no matter what's going on. So that's, I'm just going to leave that right there. Does alcohol produce more power and fuel economy than gasoline? Like, if, you know, your ethanol gas, like, you know, you got 10, this is 10% ethanol, or you got E85. You seen this E85 on the pumps? You know, that's 85% alcohol. And you can't just pour that in any car. You know, it doesn't produce as much fuel economy. But your, your cars that can run off of that, here's another little thing if you're ever thinking about, I say you're thinking about buying a car, you know, sometime in the future that's like 08 or 09 or 10 model or something like that. And, and then you say, this one here is flexible fuel. I don't know if I want that or not. Well, it's really not bad to buy a flexible fuel car because everything in there is corrosion resistant and bulletproof. The way they make the injectors and the fuel pump and all is a heck of a lot stronger and better and more durable <laughs> than plain old gasoline engine stuff. And if you try to run alcohol, and, uh, and people do that. People will take that E85 and just because it's, you know, it doesn't cost quite as much, and they'll shoot it in their car. And um, it'll, you know, you'll, that's why we had that you know, an engine performance the other time. We saw how you could measure, find out how much alcohol is in the fuel. Uh, that guy over at Solomon Chevrolet told me, he said, when their car will be running like crap, sometimes they draw some of the fuel out of it and run that test on it. It'll be like 60 or 70 percent alcohol. And somebody put it in a regular car that wasn't designed to run on it. Now, your oxygen sensor on the cars that are set up for it will be able to, they used to put a sensor in there that would tell the engine controller how much of this mix with alcohol. And it could alter the air fuel mix and the timing and all that. Now they just use the oxygen sensor. The oxygen sensor tells it, you know, because of the way the uh, it looks, it'll change the air fuel mixture that way. So they took they make, took a lot of the hardware off. So Those are, so huh? Don't. huh? So don't. It does not do as well. That's right. Um, I tried one time back, uh, I was playing around once with uh, a two-cycle engine one time down in uh, southeast Texas when I was working down there. Had it in the vice up there and I would crank it up and, blah, 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 and I was running it and all. And I ran out of, I didn't have any gas in my little can over there. So I got some denatured alcohol and mixed some oil in that and poured it in there. And it just didn't have the power. It was blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, that's so interesting. I, at the time, I didn't know any better. Um, you're in a combustion and why does the ignition start burn out while energy is still available in the ignition coil? Anybody remember that? I talked about that. Here's what the spark, here's what it looks like when the spark, you know, you're, you got the, this back down here on your spark. Your spark jumps up like this. And that's how much it takes to fire the plug. And then you've got a little bit of a of a table here. And this is, this is, a, this is a very idealistic drawing. But then there's, well, actually, I'm doing that. There's a little up kick. And then there's this, like that. Okay, so whenever it's got this, this is where the spark plug fires. All right. This is how long it burns. This is what it takes to keep the spark there after it fires. Okay, this is how long it burns, and you notice it's harder and harder and harder for it to keep the spark there, and then finally the spark burns out, and then you've got some oscillations here that's leftover energy that could have been used if it was needed. Now, if you ever see a, a pattern on your ignition oscilloscope that looks like this, then you got a weak ignition coil or weak power going into the coil or something. Uh, an ideal pattern, ought to look, I mean, it ought to have, you know, Reserve energy squiggles out there just like that. Now you're going to see other stuff going on over here that has to do with the saturation of the coal and all that, but I'll that out for simplicity. Um, the reason that this spark does like it does is you wind up with the, the molecules of fuel that are in there providing a current path. You got compressed air in there, then you got your molecules of fuel, and that spark is actually burning through those molecules of fuel. And when all of those molecules of fuel are oxidized and all of it's used up, it starts to get harder and harder for that spark to stay there. That's what this kicks up for. And then whenever it burns out, all this leftover is like snapping a rubber band. Bang, you know, that's what it does there. Now, if it ever snaps you, you'll feel like somebody snapped you. You know what I'm saying? You've been there. If you ever get shot by a car. I have. Yeah. It kind of feels, it kind of feels, yeah, it kind of feels like, like that. 
That's what it kind of feels like, except it feels, you know. And what you can do if you take a, if I was to take this little, uh, something like this, you know, little computer person's uh, tool, they got a, a wrist strap with a ground on it. You put that on there and you ground that to the engine block. If it does get your hand, it won't go past here. And you won't even feel it up here. And what I always do sometimes if I'm fooling with spark plug wires with a pair of pliers, I'll get me a good jumper wire and jumper the wire, the pliers to the uh, engine block somewhere. And if it does jump, it'll hit the plier and you won't even feel it because it runs through the ground wire into the block. Now, there are some of these yo-yos that'll feel of that stuff, you know, because they like getting shocked. You know, I mean, some people do. They just, they kind of enjoy that, you know. But um, anyway, uh, so that's what that is. Everybody, got, is everybody clear on what I just explained to you there? Okay. Um, if an, it, it, it was a long time, and I, I read a lot of scope patterns in my time. It was a long time. The first time I ever really used an oscilloscope to troubleshoot ignition system was in 1983 over at the Volkswagen dealership Enterprise. And we had an oscilloscope that was suspended from the ceiling that you could move to any stall. It was a big old thing. And I, run, and I had this Volkswagen Rabbit that I was, uh, I'm telling you this for a reason because it's going back to what we were talking about there. And it was not running worth a flip, but you'd gas it and it just, ah, blah, 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 you know, and it was just not. It, and and those, those rabbits have got a mechanical fuel injection system on them. And it was a Bosch uh, KJetronic fuel injection system, kind of like a uh, DeLorean has on it. But anyway, that thing was doing this crazy stuff. And uh, I hooked the scope up to it. And what I saw here, when I would gas it, what I saw here was this right here. This crazy, this crazy looking mess here. Instead of a regular normal sparkle. And I was just learning about ignition scope patterns then. And you know what was wrong with that one? This stupid fuel filter was stopped up. Go figure. The one time Lamont uh, that's working over at Nissan, he called me over there and he says, um, uh, I've got a, a vehicle that I'm working on here and whatever, it, it idles just fine, but when you give it the gas, it falls on its face and the other guys in the shop were telling me it's a EGR valve and all this kind of stuff. And he says, and I don't know what it is. And, uh, and he, because he says, can you come by? I said, yeah, I'll go in there and look at that. And so he noticed that whenever you would take your hand and hold it and partially cover up the intake manifold, in other words, where it couldn't get as much air, it would accelerate normally. Um, um, um. Well, that's making you think there's a fuel problem, right? Because you've choked off some of the air and you've enriched your air fuel mix, right? But... That wasn't what was wrong with it. And what was going on there was the ignition coil was weak. <laughs> and I said, I said, let me show you how you can do this. And so I got in the test light. And I said, now let's get it where the coil tower is popping against this test light. Hook the test light in the ground like we do and you're holding that. That way it ain't going to bite you. Just let it jump and hit the test light. It won't light the bulb, but it'll jump and hit the right. It's easy to hold the thing. And you got a ground here. It's already built to do that. I mean, you can make it handy. So anyway, I said, all right, now what? So he started stretching it, and it got about that far, and then the spark burned out. It wouldn't jump more than about that far. If you put a call on here, it would be okay. And then I said to Lamont, do you remember, right after you came over here, he was working on the Cadillac. And I told you about this in class when we were at school. Nobody was listening, apparently. I said, he pulled the Cadillac into his stall. He hooks up the jumper cable, I mean the uh, battery charger to it, because it needed to be charged. It was off the used car a lot. Wants to back it out. And went, nah, 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 nah. Can't get it started. Well, that had nothing to do with him charging the battery. I don't know why it shows him to do it. But uh, he was talking to me on the phone about that one. This was before the one I just told you about. And I said, uh, you looked at the spark? Well, yeah. I said, what's the spark look like? And he said, well, it'll jump a quarter of an inch. And, of course, that's what your textbooks usually say to check for. I said, it needs to jump a lot farther than that. You better make, it better scare the crap out of you. It needs to be lightning. It needs to be an inch long and popping real hard to where you're afraid to get anywhere near it. And if you're stretching it out and it's kind of orange and weak or it burns out when it's about three-eighths or half an inch long, it ain't going to start that Cadillac. And so, uh, anyway, he got an ignition coil because he had a weak spark, put it on there, boom. And I don't know how many times I've seen a mechanic that really knew his stuff would check for the spark, and they see a spark about a quarter of an inch long, and they say, well, I'm done with that, and they go on the fuel injection and everything, and they get all in over their head, when the, the spark wasn't strong enough, if the spark ain't strong enough, you ain't going to start. Well, see, on that one, it wouldn't start. On the other one, when you'd, ga when you'd gas it, it would, you know, with it partially covered up, it'd rev up normally, but otherwise it'd go, ah, blah, blah, blah. Now, there's a third thing that can happen. You can have a good, strong spark, 
but the rotor can be burnt through. The rotor button in the distributor, if it punches through that, on the old Chevrolets, it wouldn't start. But on some of the newer ones, it's got more distance for it to jump through. It'll get idle smooth, but when you give it the gas, it'll go dead or fall on its face or something like that. And I had one guy, I told him at the Ford place, I said, check that, that Bronco 2 was doing that. I said, check that rotor. And he says, no, this has got something to do with fuel because I can cover up part of the intake and it runs normally. I'm going to clean injectors and all this other hogwash. So he did all that and it still ran like crap. And pulled it off the road and burnt through. We had one of them here we did. I mean, it's just, you know, you got to think outside the box. What seems like, the point I'm trying to make is, I was looking at this and I thought I had an ignition problem and I had a fuel problem. Well, people covering up the intake part of the way and it revs up normally, they think they've got a fuel problem, but it turns out to be an ignition problem. You have to understand the relationship between those two and how they, what the dynamics of the way that engine works is. All right. That's one of the reasons you're in school, isn't it? Okay, now, if an engine is running too hot, what harmful gas increases? Think about it. You should already know that based on what I've told you earlier. If the engine's running a little too hot, what harmful gas increases? Knocks, remember? Oh, okay. Think about it. The engine getting too hot, it'll make knocks. If an engine's running too cold, which harmful gas increases? If it's running cold, it's running rich, right? Why do you think the engine controller throws you a PO125 code or a PO128 code? PO128 code means it's not running warm enough to burn clean. PO125 code means it's just doggone running too cold. That van that we just got through working on really needs a thermostat put in it because it's not running warm enough. It needs to run 210 if it's going to run good and clean. Uh, Adam put the other two thermostats in it. I mean, he could put a third one in it. And yeah, I told him, I said, sometimes you got to put two or three thermostats in there to get a good one because they're making them in China now. It's just the way it is. And uh, we even took the thermostat out of my Jeep that time when it was running wheel cold. When it, went. it was just crazy how this worked. You know, you think, well, I'm going to pull this thermostat out. We're going to put it in a pan of water. We're going to put a, therm a thermometer in there. We're going to heat this thing up until the water's boiling. And we're going to see when this thermostat starts to open. Watching the thermometer, thermostat starts to open. It started, started about 195, 200 degrees. I said, well... That ought to be okay, but since we got it out there, let's just put a thermostat in there. Because it was running real cold, like around 140 degrees. We put a thermostat in there, and it normalized. But it seemed to be fine in the pan of water. Now, the other time, that's not a good test of, of an engine that's running too cold. But what it is a good test of, and we've had one in here that was running too hot, dropped the thermostat in there, and we got the water to just bubble and boil in a high rolling boil where it was 210. And the thermostat was still closed. It never would open. So that tells you why that one was overheating, don't you see? But if you're wondering why one is running too cold, yeah, just put a thermostat in it if it's running too cold. But that's all it is anyway. There's not any real reason to test it because sometimes your test will lead you to believe that, you know, if I put that same one back in there, I'd have the same trouble. I don't know exactly why it did good in the water, but it didn't do good under pressure. But whatever happens. Which vehicle emission does the evaporative system control? That was hydrocarbons. Evaporating gasoline, what you're smelling when you pump gas at the gas pump or when somebody spills the gas out here in the shop is hydrocarbons. Uh, on the carburetors that they used to put on there, they had a big old pipe coming off of the reservoir bowl that would go over there to the carbon canister too. Carbon canisters have been on there a long time. Now, they used to have the carbon canister only purging vapors when EGR was flowing. They'd have it hooked on so when you're, when you're, now EGR was never supposed to happen at idle. Carbon canister, I mean, canister purge was never supposed to happen at idle. Now, when somebody puts the gas in there and they pack it in, you got to have airspace in that tank. That's why they have that hose. You might know this. I'm going to tell you this stuff while I'm thinking about it because I'll forget it. The filler hose has got another hose inside of it, usually. That's basically. And whenever you're putting gas in there, when the gas comes up to this level here, your gas pump hose can't breathe. Because it's got a little air tube going up in it. Click, and it clicks off. 
and you can shake the car and put a little more, shake the car and put a little more. And I've known people that had a like a Ford uh, excursion, not an excursion, expedition, and it was supposed to hold like 22 gallons, and they kept shaking it and putting it in there until they got like 28 gallons in there. And they were saying, hey, how come we can't have 28 gallons all the time? Well, they want the tank. Have you ever noticed that, that gas tanks are built, if you look at one, like they're built like that? You ever notice that? And right up in the very top of it, where this little, of course, you got the fuel pump and all that stuff in there, too. You know, it's over here somewhere. Matter of fact, the, the fuel pump will usually be nowadays, when they put it in there, if they got it on spring-loaded stems, so that the fuel pump will be right on the bottom of the tank. And they used to have a fuel pump mounted so that it had a little sock that was dragging fuel from about that far off the bottom. Well, the problem with that is you'd get water in there, and it would fill up to where there was lots of water, and then it would make this wave in there whenever you made a curve, and it would drink a bunch of water. Poof, your engine quits. Oh, fire up eventually. But what, and you got to have condensation in here that's going to drip down in here. That's why it's good to keep your gas tank full. You got you, do you, do you uh, keep your gas tank full? No. You let it run about on empty all the time. No, all the time. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's bad. Don't do that. Keep it full. Keep it full. If you keep it full, you'll have fewer problems. But! They say you can put uh, a cap full of alcohol in there. Yeah, alcohol helps. It'll suspend the water in the gas. But if you got a lot of water in there, that a cap full ain't gonna help a whole lot. Like uh, rubbing alcohol? Yeah, yeah it's uh, alcohol. denatured alcohol, rubbing alcohol, like that. Yeah, and it'll help. But pour some in and it'll take care. Of don't do a whole lot. But what we got here is this thing here is pulling gas right off the bottom of the tank. That way, the little bit of water gets in there, it processes it. See what I'm saying? That's why they got them run on the bottom of the tank now. They didn't used to do that. Um, but anyway, your gas is in here like that. And the fuel filler has got it so that it'll stop it. Now, they want airspace in here. Now, your, your little vapor canister thing, it's got a little valve in here so that if the car rolls over, it's like a snorkel. stops it up so it won't dump gas everywhere. On the Fords, when you have a crash, it trips the inertia switch and kills the fuel pump, so it won't run. All right, so what you got here? I don't know. Hey, Jimmy, you doing all right? How you doing, Mr. Smith? Come on in here. You can stand in here while we're doing this. This is uh, Mark. I see one of my old students up there around Brantley. Well, you can tell me from Brantley is the way you live. All right, so <laughs> anyway, coming out of here, we're going up here to our carbon canister. And it actually is going to make its way to the carbon canister, and then your uh, engine controller energizes this little solenoid valve and pulls it out. Now, where I was going with that was, on these newer ones, even if it's just sitting there idling, it may start trying to purge the canister. And you might hear that valve going, you know, you're on a, on a Jeep, and on my yellow Jeep, when people change the oil, and I have people change the oil in here, somehow or another, they always push that little... Carbon canister is mounted on rubber, so you won't hear the noise, and they'll get it up under the air conditioning line. And I'll be sitting there idling, that's like we're going, it'll sound like the engine's knocking. Scare you to death. You know, golly, why is it knocking, you know? I mean, it's got the right cadence that it sounds like an engine knocking out, but when you move that little thing, it ain't making a noise anymore. But anyway, it'll do that. And this one lady called me on the phone at the Ford place, and she said, uh, when I, sometimes I'll be sitting here at a stoplight, and the wind star will be running real smooth. And then all of a sudden, it'll almost die, and then it'll kick up, and it'll surge ahead and almost run into somebody. And I said, are you packing gas in the tank when you fill it up? And she says, well, yeah, I just about always do. I said, stop doing that, and it'll go away. Because what happens is, it's sitting here with a saturated canister because liquid fuel has managed to gurgle past this thing and get into the canister. Now when it starts purging it, it don't know what's in there. It's sucking liquid fuel in there, almost kills the engine. The idle air control says, oh, crap, the engine's about to die. I need to open up. It opens up and it overshoots. And you're sitting here without your foot on the brake on the heart, and it tries to move ahead, see? And you cause the problem by packing the gas. You see what I'm saying? Had to educate her. Well, she didn't have any more trouble after she quit packing the gas. That's how that kind of thing works. All right. Anybody got any questions or comments about that? Number 12, if the engine's running too cold, you get carbon monoxide and hydrocarbons. That's number 12.